we are. Great. Well, thank you all for coming again. Um, now it's time for our featured speaker of the evening at our special Nerdy Knitters and Crocheters event tonight. We are so excited to have Margaret Holzman tonight. She is the author of Geometric Knit Blankets. And so for those of you who don't yet have the book, this is what it looks like. If you have the book in front of you, you can share it and show it with everybody. We are giving away a few of these later in the meeting. She brings a fresh new perspective to the way that we think about knitted blanket construction. This is, the, this is a unique style that has never been published before. And we are so excited to hear her speak tonight. Jill, who you met a minute ago, she suggested to our guild that we would enjoy hearing Margaret speak. Jacinda discovered the book. And between Jacinda, Jill, and Jen, they arranged for her to come. And we are so, so happy that she's here tonight. And big round of applause for our organizers, Jill, Jen, and Jacinda for having her come tonight. Big round of applause, a Zoom applause. So Jill told me and when she saw Margaret's book, she said that as an avid blanket knitter and a New Englander, so Jill's in Boston, she has always wondered if it was possible to translate some of the great quilt patterns that, um, that are so fabulous um, in fabric and to translate that into knitted blankets. Well, Jill got her wish and now we have geometric knit blanket patterns tonight. And uh, I have to admit, Jill, that I've actually been wondering the same thing and I'm sure there's many others as well who are wondering how, to, how that works. So please, with a big round of applause, um, Zoom applause, please help me welcome the author of Geometric Knit Blankets and all around amazing designer, Margaret Holzman. Woo! Thank you. <laughs> all right. Um, yeah, thank you for having me. It's, it's a pleasure to be here and to see all those books that you guys have bought. That's, that's exciting to me. So, and I can't wait to start seeing projects that people are making and see what colors you choose. I do have a, a Facebook group, so that's a great place to post your blankets in progress. I'm going to talk about the book, Geometric Knit Blankets, came out on uh, March the 12th. It's published by Stackpole Books, and you can buy it at Amazon and on the website for the book, which is in green there. I have a lot of other online stores listed, depending on where you live, that, that you could buy it. The book includes patterns for 30 knitted blankets, and there's a lot of illustrations of how to construct them. And it's really just the beginning of what's offered. There's a QR code at the end of the book that translates or resolves into a link to an extras website. That includes optional charts. You don't need any charts because everything is in the written instructions, but if you'd like to work from charts, there's a number of blankets that have the pattern stitches laid out in charts there. And I'm substitutions for discontinued yarns, which unfortunately there are already a few colors that have been discontinued. There's technique videos that I've produced. And also eventually there'll be the errata for the patterns and tips and hints for making the blankets based on questions and correspondence that I get from knitters. So how the book came to be? Well, I've been designing since 2013. I, my first design was a blanket. After that, uh, publishing a couple blankets and really simple things like headbands, I started to write proposals for knitting magazines. So I got really lucky at first I was published in Interweave Knits a couple times. And then I started being kind of a regular in Creative Knitting Magazine. And those magazines are really much more into garments and accessories. So I did a lot of sweater patterns for them. And always I like to work with unusual constructions or things that at least I hadn't done before. So the first geometric thing that I did was really this tank top here which is constructed in the same way that the blankets are constructed. And then I like to work, you know, on the diagonal. And um, I had fun doing this art. This was for the Art of Circular Yokes, which is an interweave book. I like to do things with, to experiment with different construction styles. In 2018, I was working on a bunch of patterns for the home for Knit Picks collections. And so they were like stranded Fair Isle work, um, which... I really love to design, but I don't actually like to knit it. 
And this one over here was like a texture blanket. And this one here was actually a kind of a geometric style because these pieces are all worked in a different direction, just like the blankets are, but it was done in stockinette and cables. In 2018, I got this idea to knit this Prisma blanket. And later I'll show you the inspiration for that, but I'm, I'm not quite there yet. And I was calling it the geometric blanket. I put it on the testing pool for testing and I had a whole bunch of testers. I think there were maybe 10 or 11 testers and there was a rectangular version of the blanket and a square version. And so you can see this blanket in various stages of construction. These are photos from the sample knitters. And here is Rachel Harold with probably a relative of hers. I don't know, maybe her mother, I don't know, or grandma, I'm not really sure. So, but she's you know featuring here her, her test knit for the geometric blanket which later I named Prisma. I also did this wall hanging that's based on the same construction. I have that in my family room now, but I never published it. So to me, uh, a blanket is kind of like what a blank canvas is to a painter. I, I feel like there's a lot of freedom in designing a blanket because I don't have to worry about how it fits or you don't have to worry as much about the gauge. You still have to worry a little bit. So I, I don't have to worry about whether it's stylish or fashionable. And it's, it's really kind of like a blank campus for me to do what I feel like on it. Um, and while all the time while I was working on these sweaters for the magazines and book collections, I was jotting down these ideas I was having about blanket designs. In 2017, my husband and I both retired. I was a software systems engineer at Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And before that, I was at Bell Labs in New Jersey. I had a 32-year career in engineering. And then... Um, I started, after having a whole lot of more ideas about blankets, I started writing the book in October of 2018. Although I really liked working on all those sweaters for the magazines and book collections, I feel like the blankets and just generally indie patterns and doing a book really gives me the most freedom of expression because I get to pick the theme. When you're submitting proposals to a magazine or book collection, you're writing and designing to their theme, not your own. And I had control over the designs. I, I got to choose which ones went in the book and which ones were rejected versus an editor at a book collection or a magazine. I chose the yarn, the colors. I chose who to work with from photographer, sample knitters, tech editor, and I chose when to work. I didn't mind working to a due date, but if you don't like to work to a fixed due date, then you can, you can self-publish like to Ravelry and Etsy and other places or you can wait until your manuscript is done to shop around for a publisher. And then of course they know exactly what they're getting. Uh, my husband has written a few books and he, I think for the first couple ones, he waited until he had the full manuscript to shop around for a publisher. The theme of the book is colorful geometric designs that are worked mostly without traditional color work. So that means there's, there, there are two blankets that have intarsa, so I say mostly, but there's no stranded or fair isle work. So all the color work that's in the blanket is created by shaping, um, and it uses one of the techniques, one or more of them actually, in the green box on the right-hand side. And so these techniques, the, those are the abbreviations that are used in the construction diagram. So this is a, a little figure from the front of the book where those are defined. And the inspiration for everything in the book is quilts, tile designs, and just the possibilities of garter stitch knitting. Some of the blankets have multiple construction op options, and those are mostly there to reduce the number of ends to weave in and to reduce the amount of sewing. And I think there's 11 blankets that have multiple construction options. All the blankets can be made without any charts. There are a couple charts. There's two charts in the entire book. The, they don't have to be used. If you do like charts, you can find them in the extras website, especially for the more uh, complex pattern stitches. I'll talk about the extras website later. One of the big questions was, do I want to self-publish or do I want to use a publisher? And the main benefits of using a publisher is distribution and advertising. The distribution is printing of your book, you know, get while well, getting it ready to print, producing the final layout and printable version. I didn't have to do that. I just had to submit my patterns and illustrations and they did all that. Um, and then they handled the working with the printer, getting it carried in online stores getting it carried in the brick and mortar stores and generally shipping and all that kind of stuff. And, and they do some advertising. I was inclined to use a publisher because I'm a first time author. If I was going to use a publisher, I wanted the publisher on board from the start because I wanted to be able to ask them questions and take advantage of all the knowledge that they have of the industry. 
I needed to find a publisher. How I started that was I went onto Amazon and I pulled up top rated, top selling knitting books that had been published in the last three or four years. And I made a list of the publishers. And then I created the equivalent of a first chapter of a novel. That first chapter for a knitting book is going to be a set of example designs. Then I, I wrote a proposal, including those designs and a description of my book and what I thought was unique about it. And I did sort of a market analysis, you know, tried to show that this was a unique book, that it was a little different from what's out there already and that there was a demand for it. I sent out that proposal. Now, some of the, some of the publishers, they wanted an online proposal, like a PDF file, and some wanted like snail mail printed out proposals. So whatever they wanted, that's what I sent them. So eventually I heard from all of them. So they have very good manners. So 50% of them said that they had stopped publishing knitting books. So even though I'd seen books by them in the last few years, they had decided to exit that market. The others pretty much said that there was no demand for a blanket book. You know, that was a little disheartening, but Stackpole Books, who I ended up choosing as the publisher, um, they were very excited about this book and enthusiastic from just a few days after they received the proposal. It was meant to be with Stackpole Books. And so we negotiated a contract and we decided that the manuscript would be due in December of 2019. I've written some blogs about the knitting design process, including this topic in detail. So if you want to learn more about what I learned through this process, then you can visit my website where the blog is. So a book of 5 million stitches begins with sample knitting. When I looked at my own rate of production of blankets. So I only knit in the evenings because I usually try to do design work during the day. And it takes me about two and a half months. That would be optimistic, maybe three months to knit a blanket. If I was going to have 30 blankets in the book, which is what the publisher was asking for at two and a half months per blanket, my optimistic estimate, that would be over six years to knit all the blankets in the book. You know, I only had 14 months until the manuscript was due. And that was going to be 79 miles of yarn to knit. And I don't think one person can do that very easily. So I decided to have sample knitters. And, and so what I wanted to do, because these weren't going to be garments, they were going to be large items that had a lot of yarn in them and good quality yarn. I thought that maybe I could find some sample knitters that would be willing to work in return for the yarn and to get a complimentary copy of the book. I recruited some sample knitters from the testing group on Ravelry. So I had three, three knitters. Rachel Harold is one of those that I had worked on in, with the testing group. I think maybe Sonia was too. I put in a call on Ravelry to the test knitters group and I advertised for sample knitters and I told people up front what the arrangement was that I was offering. And I reviewed people's um, Ravelry projects and previous testing work or sample knitting work that they had done through that. And, and through also two referrals that I got from uh, sample knitters, once I had them on board, I uh, eventually got 18 sample knitters. I was the 19th one. And once we had people on board, I did a skills and preferences survey so that I could learn, you know, what skills do the knitters have and what are they willing to learn or try and what techniques do they like to or not like to use when they're knitting? So, cause that can make a big difference in how much you enjoy making something, whether you're using techniques that you enjoy or that you think are horrible. And I had a contract. I, I, I didn't know any of the sample knitters except for the three previous RAV testers. And so we had a sample to kind of lay out, you know, what was expected on both sides. I didn't have all the designs ready at the beginning. I was designing kind of as I would go along and Sample knitters ended up being organized into kind of like a phase one and a phase two group. Those groups were in contact by email. And so we would share pretty much weekly. People would share in an email a photo of the blanket that they were knitting and the progress. And it was nice. It was very um, collaborative and encouraging. I, and I, I love to see those emails. Sample knitters made between one and four blankets each. And so here's a map that this map appears at the back of the book. And this is a map of where the sample knitters all live and how many blankets were knit by each person. Tonight we have Sonia, who is down here in Signal Hill. I'm in Monrovia. Lynette was caravanning with her family during a big part of the knitting that she did. And in, in these, I asked her where she was. And so I put these little areas and she now lives in Arizona. Rachel Harold in Maine, Julie Anderson in Spring Lake, Michigan. 
I had people all over the country. I also had one sample knitter in Canada. Some other early decisions about the book was I had to decide on the template, which is just the organization of each pattern. I had to come up with a style guide. I had always before gone along with the style guide of whichever magazine or book I was designing for. Once I was writing my own pattern, I needed a style guide. And so I wrote one, abbreviations, which I got from the Craft Yarn Council. And then I added to those. And then I had to decide what kinds of software I was going to use to support the design process. What was I going to use to do math? And that was Excel and charts. I used Stitch Mastery and illustrations. I used PowerPoint and Adobe Illustrator. For more information, the starred items, you go to my blog and I have the style guide I actually have there and the pattern template. So you can download those things. To round out the team, I needed a technical editor. I had worked with a technical editor at Notions Magazine. Her name is Natalie Del Busso. She became my technical editor. And then I was lucky that my husband is a photographer. His hobby has always been portrait photography and with a little arm twisting, I was able to get him to photograph the blankets like around the house and in the yard and, and so forth. So I got some pretty good photos. The next thing is yarn support. With 30 blankets and with using quality yarn, the cost of the yarn and the book was threatening to be more than any money that I would make in royalties. And so it was really necessary to get yarn support. And so this pink box at the top, that's all the companies that provided yarn support. And I was really lucky because with just one or two exceptions, all the companies I approached agreed to support one or more blankets in the book. So yarn support, if you don't know, it's when a yarn company provides a designer with complementary yarn to use in a design. And of course, you're expected to publish that design. So they have a chance of having people's attention drawn to their yarn. What I did to figure out which yarns I wanted to use was I researched them. And so I went to Webs, Jimmy Beans, and Lovecraft. So those are all online yarn stores. And I downloaded lists of all the yarn brands that they sell. As I sorted them alphabetically, and then I researched all 171 yarn brands. And so what I was looking for was washable worsted weight yarn. And I was looking for like a large range of colors in the, in the yarn line because I wanted to make colorful blankets. And so I wanted a lot of choice. Eventually I got down to about 40 yarn lines that I thought were suitable for use in these blankets. And so I would come up with a design and I would think about the colors that I wanted in that. And then I would go and look at these 40 yarn lines that I'd narrowed it down to, to see which one seemed like the best match for a given design. I would write a yarn support request, and then I would have to determine the person to contact. I started out by like looking on LinkedIn and doing web searches. And, but anyway, I found out eventually through trial and error that just using the contact us on the yarn company's webpage was actually the best way to get to somebody. And you know, I would just write a brief paragraph describing the book and pointing out my website so that they could look at my previous work. And then within a couple of days or maybe a week at most, I would hear back and either I would hear from the person that was the right person I'd, or I'd hear from somebody else and they'd give me the contact information. Here's an example of a yarn proposal. This one was the one for the shadow play blanket and it features Plymouth Select Worsted Merino Superwash. At the top, I have a description of the blanket and the name. And then I like to make my yarn proposals all in one page make it so that if they decide they want to support the blanket, they have everything that they need in the yarn proposal to actually assemble the yarn that I need and ship it out. So I, I have the yarn requirements and I have my mailing address, or if I knew who the sample knitter was, I would give them the sample knitter address.